Hi everyone. This lesson is the first of two about our next type of biological molecule, the carbohydrates. In this lesson, we're going to focus on small carbohydrates called monosaccharides and disaccharides. But first, we'll start with a general introduction to carbohydrates. So what is a carbohydrate? Well, we've all heard about carbs, you know, things like pasta and sugary snacks and baked goods. And there's a lot of controversy as to whether carbs are good for you or bad for you. But we're going to focus on carbohydrates at this point, just from a biochemistry point of view. So if you take a look at this word carbohydrate, and look at what's in there. Carbohydrates are relatively simple molecules that generally contain only carbon, hydrogen, and oxygen. In terms of their functions, they are energy sources and provide energy storage for living organisms. So carbohydrates are all about energy. And like the proteins that we saw before, they follow this monomer polymer pattern. So just like you could take amino acid monomers and link them together to form protein polymers as such, you can also take carbohydrate monomers and link them together to form carbohydrate polymers. So let's start by learning about the monomers of carbohydrates. Monomers of carbohydrates are molecules called monosaccharides. It's a big word, watch out for the spelling. But if you pick it apart, mono is a word root prefix for one, and then saccharide is from a Greek word root meaning sugar. So these are our simple sugars. In terms of their function, they are a quick energy source for living organisms. They don't need to be broken down into smaller parts in order to provide energy. They're just really fast energy. As for their structure, Every monosaccharide is a simple carbon skeleton with multiple hydroxyl groups and one carboxyl group. So if you take a look at this simple monosaccharide over here, we've got two hydroxyl groups and a carboxyl group up there. Here's another one. You'll see it's very similar, but it's a little bit different in terms of where everything is. The hydroxyl groups are over here and the carboxyl group is in the middle. So the carboxyl group does not have to be at the tip of a molecule in a monosaccharide. If we look at an even bigger one, once again, you can see multiple hydroxyl groups and one carboxyl group. There it is. If you want to know the formula of a monosaccharide, they all follow a really consistent pattern. They all have a formula that's a multiple of CH2O, or you could write it as CNH2NON, meaning that for however many carbons are in the molecule, in the carbon skeleton, there'll be twice as many hydrogens and the same number of oxygens as carbons. So if you take a look at this first molecule here, we've got one, two, three carbons. So there should be six hydrogens. One, two, three, four, five, six. That's correct. And then the same number of oxygens as carbon. So there should be three oxygens, and indeed there are. How about this molecule here? What do you think? Yep, also C3H6O3. So what does that mean for these two molecules? Do you remember what that makes them? They have the same formula, different structures, so they are isomers. If we move on to this larger molecule over here, we've got one, two, three, four, five carbons. So if our rule holds, it should be C5H10O5, and indeed it is. Now every molecule needs a name, not just a formula. So how do we name monosaccharides? Well, sugar names generally end in the suffix os, and the system we use is we take the Greek word root for the number of carbons, and then we add the suffix os. So if we take another look at this molecule we saw on the previous slide, we've got one, two, three carbons, so we'd use the prefix tri and add os, trios. This one has five carbons, so it would be pentose. But if you remember that previous slide, we had two molecules that had the same formula. We had isomers, and clearly they were not exactly the same molecule. So we're going to need to adjust the system a little bit and have different names for isomers. So let's take a look at these larger molecules over here. And while we're at it, I wanted to point out something kind of interesting here. You'll notice that the hydroxyl groups on this side of the molecule all have that OH that we're used to. But on this side, it's written as HO, which is a little bit weird. That's because the carbon binds to the oxygen not the hydrogen. So it's still just a hydroxyl group, but it's written as HO instead. So if you take a look at each of these molecules, we've got one, two, three, four, five, six carbons. So our formula for this would be C6H12O6. For the second one, also C6H12O6. And the third one, yeah, C6H12O6. So they're all isomers. The, the structure is different. You can see that the carboxyl group is in a slightly different place, or in this one, the hydroxyl group position is flipped. These are all isomers and they have six carbons, so they'd all be called hexoses, but clearly they're not the same molecule, so we need different names for them. This first one is called glucose, 
which you've probably heard of. The second one is called fructose, and the last one is called galactose. I'll put little stars here because these are three molecules that you need to memorize. You need to know their names, and you can't tell their exact formula from their names, so you also need to name their, um, memorize their formulas. Now this first one, glucose, that's pretty important in biology, so we'll take a look at that a little bit more. Glucose is considered important because it's the most common monosaccharide in living cells. It's the form of energy that our cells take up most efficiently, so you could almost say it's the type of sugar that our cells like the most, they can use it the best. And a lot of what we eat gets broken down into glucose. When people refer to blood sugar, what they're actually referring to is the amount of glucose in their blood. One thing I want to mention, this is not the same thing as table sugar. So if you go to the grocery store, you buy a bag of sugar, or you buy sugar cubes, that's not this. This is a different kind of sugar that you can't really buy as easily. In terms of its structure, there's actually two forms of glucose that we see, two different structures it can take. One of them is a straight chain form that you're seeing here, but that only occurs when the glucose is completely dry. And if you think about your own body, you know there's a lot of water in there. So it's never completely dry, and the glucose is gonna take on a different form. When it's in a watery environment, it actually folds up into a ring, and it looks kinda like this. And this looks kinda weird because you say, hey, where did all the carbons go? And this is a shorthand organic chemistry diagram where the corners actually represent a carbon. So you can assume that there is a carbon at every corner unless it says something different. So for example, this corner is actually an oxygen, but then every other corner is a carbon. So we've got one, two, three, four, five, six carbons. There's all six of them with the sixth one being up here. But this diagram is a little bit complicated, so we're going to ask you to memorize a slightly simpler version of it. So this is the simple or abbreviated version of the glucose diagram that we're gonna ask you to learn for this class, where you've got a six-sided shape where one corner is oxygen, and this little stick here represents the CH2, uh, excuse me, CH2OH that's sticking up off the side. So that's what you need to know about monosaccharides, but what about larger carbohydrates? How are we gonna do that? Well, we have to combine those monosaccharides to form those larger carbohydrates. So if we put two of them together, we'll get a disaccharide di being the prefix for two. If we put many monosaccharides together to make a bigger molecule, then we'll have a polysaccharide, poly being the prefix meaning many. How are we gonna do that? Can you remember a reaction that we can use to bind molecules together to make a larger molecule? Yeah, it's that condensation reaction and dehydration synthesis. So let's go through an example of that. Here I have a glucose molecule, C6H12O6. And I want to combine that with another glucose molecule to form a larger molecule. So in this condensation or dehydration reaction, as you'll remember, we need to take out a water molecule. So where could we find the ingredients for a water molecule? Well, in this instance, it's going to be here. So we're going to take the hydroxyl from the first glucose and the hydrogen from the second glucose, and those will come together to form a water molecule. But now this carbon over here is kind of lonely, and this oxygen here is also a little bit lonely, so they're gonna end up attaching together. And when they come together, we get this molecule here, which is called maltose. And what we've made here, this new bond here, is a glycosidic linkage. It's a special type of covalent bond between monosaccharides, where this oxygen has bound to the carbon of that other, uh, that other monosaccharide over there. But we've also made what? Yeah water. So we've got the water coming out too. Now how are we going to figure out the formula for this maltose? We started with two molecules of C6H12O6, but then we also took out water. So if we take six carbons and six carbons, we get 12. If we add 12 hydrogens and 12 hydrogens, we get 24, but then we also took two away, so that leaves 22. And we added together six oxygens and six oxygens, making 12, but we took one away, so that's 11. So we end up with the formula C12H22O11. So that's how to make a disaccharide. And there are a lot of different disaccharides out there, so we're going to look at a few more of them. So there's maltose, made by combining glucose and glucose, as you just saw. We've also got sucrose made by combining glucose and fructose. If we take a look at that, here's a molecule of glucose, here's a molecule of fruc fructose, excuse me, put those together and we get sucrose with another glycosidic linkage here and a molecule of water. So it's the same process. And sucrose is that table sugar that I referred to earlier. So this is what you get if you go to the grocery store and you buy a bag of sugar or you buy sugar cubes, you're actually buying sucrose. 
Another common disaccharide to know is lactose, made by combining glucose and galactose. And lactose is indeed that milk sugar that you've probably heard of, the one that a lot of people cannot digest. And there are those stars again. That means you need to know these three disaccharides. So you should know which monosaccharides we put together to get each one of these and what the formulas are. We already went through calculating the formula for maltose, and you can figure out how to calculate the formulas for sucrose and lactose. But what if we want to put together many, many monosaccharides? What are we going to get? Yeah, polysaccharide, maybe something like this, where you can see lots and lots of glycosidic linkages between those monosaccharides. And I'd like to take a moment to focus on the glycosidic linkages for just a second. There are different types of glycosidic linkages out there, and there are two that you're going to need to know for this class. So the first one is called alpha. And the way you can recognize whether a molecule has alpha glycosidic linkages is if all of the monomers, all of the monosaccharides, are kind of facing the same direction. So if you take a look at this molecule here, you'll notice that all of the glucoses have their CH2OH kind of facing the same way. It's at the top left of the molecule. And if you look at the glycosidic linkages between the monosaccharides, you'll see that they also kind of face the same way. In this case, they all look like they're sort of facing downwards. So that's how you can recognize an alpha glycosidic linkage. The other one you need to know is beta. And you can recognize beta glycosidic linkages because the monomers, the monosaccharides, sort of alternate which direction they face. So if you take a look over here, the CH2OH on each glucose, sometimes it's on the top, sometimes it's on the bottom. It alternates from one molecule to the next. And same thing with the glycosidic linkages. So one faces down, the next one faces up, so on and so forth. We'll come back to these ideas in the next carbohydrate lesson but I just wanted to introduce you to it now so that you're familiar with it when we get there. So now you know all about how we can build larger carbohydrates, how to combine monosaccharides to form larger molecules, but what if we want to take apart larger carbohydrates? Well, there's a reaction you've already seen for taking molecules apart. Do you remember what it was? Yep, it was hydrolysis. So let's do a practice run of that. Here we've got maltose that we put together a few minutes ago. If we want to take it apart using hydrolysis, what do we need? Yeah, water. So we're going to take a molecule of water, an enzyme is going to come along and break that glycosidic linkage there and split the water molecule. The hydroxyl group is going to go over to this carbon here, and the hydrogen is going to attach to that oxygen there. So at the end of the reaction, we will have split the maltose into glucose and glucose, and this water molecule will have been split at the hydroxyl group here and the hydrogen there. So it's the same reaction you've seen before. So that's everything you need to know about monosaccharides and disaccharides and how carbohydrates can be built and dismantled. Until next time, take care of yourself and take care of each other.